Tom, how are you doing? Thanks for joining. Hello, mate. I'm very well. How are you? Yeah, doing, doing great, doing great. Thanks a lot for joining. What's the time there in Australia? My pleasure, mate. It's 7 p.m. here in Perth. We're on the West Coast, so 9 p.m. on the East Coast. But yeah, not yeah. too late here. Yeah. It's Friday night, so yeah, nice to be having a chat. And, and to you as well. How's lockdown going? How is it in Australia, uh, the situation actually, there? We've been, we've been very lucky here in the West um, and in Australia in general. I think our, mm. our government should be commended. They handled the whole situation pretty well. They, they shut things down pretty, pretty early on. And, and fortunately, we've, um, we're pretty isolated here in Western Australia and haven't had that many cases compared to the rest of the world. We've actually been able to get back to normal life pretty quickly. So, yeah, very lucky. Wow. Any chance of the T20 World Cup in October or is that almost certainly uh, postponed? Uh, look, I, I can't comment. I haven't actually heard anything <laughs> official, but I, I think they're going to struggle. I think yeah. something like that is such a, a revenue-raising event that I think Cricket Australia will be waiting until the latest possible uh, time in the ICC as well to, to make it happen, um, given Makes sense. they want crowds. So I don't see there being big crowds anytime soon, so I, I'd imagine it'll get postponed. Makes sense, makes sense. But I think, um, I think we'll certainly be there for the, for the test series if that goes ahead um, at the end of the year. So looking forward to that. Um, Fingers crossed. Yeah. Well, let, let's, let's get straight to it. So um, for all of our, our followers, our viewers, our members who will be watching, do you want to just start by introducing yourself? Tell us a bit about what cricket mentoring is. Yep, sure. Yeah, my name, well, I'm Tom Scully. I am a former professional cricketer quite a long time ago now for Middlesex in England. Um, as you notice, I've got an Aussie accent. I grew up in Australia, but I went over and played some club cricket in England, league cricket, and through that and through going okay, I got a contract with Middlesex. Um, I've got a British passport, so I had a few wonderful seasons with Middlesex and living in London. Um, and then came back to Australia. I started studying and looking for other options in my life once I'd finished my professional career. And I started coaching uh, young aspiring cricketers privately here in Perth. And out of that, I sort of wanted to, I started to get really passionate about helping them become better and helping them move towards their goals and ultimately reach some of their goals because I felt like that's something that I'd lacked in my life, in my career. I didn't really have a mentor. I didn't really have someone to guide me. So I suppose I started to be the person that I wish I had when I was younger. And I, I really wanted to help these young, aspiring, hungry cricketers become better. And I started my private coaching in, in July 2014 and I launched Cricket Mentoring in August 2016. So it was two years of, of sort of wanting to give more than just technique. I, I saw so many great coaches who the session would start and end at the very start and end of the, of the session. I wanted, it to, I wanted to give my players more. I wanted to give them resources to go home and, and learn and sort of develop themselves on and off the field. So... Out of, out of my sort of, I suppose, own pain and, and un, um, I didn't fulfill my full potential, I don't believe, I really wanted to help others do that. So, yeah, so Cricket Mentoring now, we've been going for a little over sort of nearly four years, coming up to four years in August. Um, we have a reasonable following online. We publish a lot of content um, across YouTube, Instagram, TikTok and, and various platforms. We, I believe there's six pillars to success and one of the main pillars is your mental side of the game and I know we're going to talk a bit about that tonight. Um, so I really focus a lot on the mindset and that's where a lot of our followers have found some value in what we, we talk about, what I talk about. Um, so yeah, I'm just trying to help educate cricketers. I'm on a mission to sort of, we've come up with this mission statement recently to develop um, highly skilled, um, adaptable and thoughtful cricketers who strive to be their best on and off the field. So a big thing for me is I think cricket's only one part of our life. And, and for Indian people, I know most people tuning in will probably be Indian. Um, cricket is a religion. It's, it's everything. But at the same time, we've got other things going on in our life. We've got other things. And if, I think I'll go into more depth in, in this later, but mm. I think cricket is just <clears> one part of what we do. So I'm trying to really help people become the best version of themselves off the field as well as on the field. Yeah, and, and the stuff that you do, sort of the, the, the coaching that you do, is that available for everyone all over the world or is it specifically for people in Australia? No, look, we're mentoring, and we're mentoring athletes um, of all ages. I've got a team of, of mentors, um, very experienced cricketers themselves and who have now moved into coaching and are becoming very experienced coaches. So I'm passing on my beliefs and philosophies and values too. And through technology, we, we mentor and coach players all over the world. We've, we've had calls this week with people in New Zealand, people on the other side of Australia, someone in the USA, someone in India. So, 
yeah, through technology, if someone if someone has a mindset of I want to get better, I want to learn about myself, um, I do video analysis for players all over the world. Um, so yeah, any part of their game or their life that they think they can get better, we try and offer some value and offer a service for that. So technology, as you're on one side of the world, I'm on the other. We're having a chat and we're there sharing across the world. So technology just connects us. And in this time of coronavirus, I think people have started to realise that you can do a lot of things through technology. Cool. So for people that may not know you from the cricketing world, they might know you from the Bollywood world. Uh, uh -huh. Because the rumours through the grapevine suggest that you actually featured in Akshay Kumar's Patiala House uh, film yes. a few years ago. What, what's the story behind that? Oh, mate, this was, this was in up there with the best few months of my life, bar sort of my, my wedding day and my, the, the birth of my daughter. Um, I, it was when I was trialling for Middlesex. It was in 2010, and I, I had a few weeks with Middlesex in the start, at the start of the season, April, I think. And then through May, a few of the big boys came back from the IPL. Owen Morgan, O.A. Shah came back. Neil Dexter at the time came back from injury, and Middlesex had a big staff, and so... Me being a trialist, I got squeezed out of the second team and I was pretty annoyed, pretty frustrated. And then I think the, the first week where I was meant to be playing second 11 as a trialist, but I didn't, couldn't get a game, I got a call from John Embry, who's the former England captain. And he said, yeah. oh, hi, he left a voicemail. And I listened to the voicemail and I was like, this is a bit weird. And I rang him back and he said, hi, Tom, I've been put in charge of finding cricketers to be a part of this Bollywood movie. Um, I've been given your number by Richard Johnson, who's the Middlesex second team. He was the Middlesex second team coach at the time. They, the, the team, the, the producers, they want cricketers to play cricketers. They don't want actors to try and be cricketers. Yeah. And I said, oh, wow, this is amazing. Like, I've got a few weeks until I'm playing again, I think. Like, oh, by the way, I've got six mates from Australia who are playing in England as well as overseas players. Do you want me to bring them along? And he was like, yeah, just the more the merrier. I'm trying to get a team together. So me and five and six of my mates, we ended up being a part of Paliala House. We travelled around, <laughs> travelled around England for three weeks. We shot shot some scenes at Chelmsford, at the Oval, at Trent Bridge. Um, it was just an incredible few weeks. And then uh, post that, I went back to playing for Middlesex, and I got my contract a few month, a couple of months later. But that whole period and that three weeks of shooting Paliala House, rubbing shoulders with Akshay Kumar, I'll have to send you yeah. a photo later of. We were playing a bit of cricket in the backyard sort of thing with him and teaching him <laughs> how to really bowl. Good? And, oh, he was a battler. He was a battler. <laughs> but he tried hard. He tried yeah, hard. But, yeah, yeah. And then out of it, so we travelled the country. We had a lot of fun. And then out of it, there was this amazing movie made. And now I, like a lot of Indian people that I meet, I say, I sort of drop it in there. I'm like, oh, my God, I've seen it. That was an amazing movie. And, it's yeah, it's pretty cool. It At was the time, a... I probably didn't realise how big it was, but now I uh, yeah, I look back and go, that was pretty cool. End of your acting career was it, or have you have you done any more features since then? Sorry, mate, I think I'm losing your internet. What was that? No, no, no worries, no worries. Let, let's crack on then to um to to to, to the cricket. Um, so lots of our members, people that will be listening, uh, are obviously massive India cricket fans. Um, but lots of them will be players themselves. So um, we want to talk mainly, you mentioned earlier, about how people can pre prepare mentally when playing the game. Uh, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a team game played by individuals. So in, in my opinion, cricket's the game where confidence plays a huge part, probably more than most other sports. Um, as a batsman, for example, you know, when you're out of nick, you literally can't buy a run. Uh, but when your confidence is high, you, you, know, you feel unstoppable. What is the reason behind cricket being such a confidence-driven sport? Well, I think it's it's such a it's such a it's a tough game, and I, I'll I sort of am a batting a batter, and I'm a batting coach, and I really think in terms of batting. But in terms of sort of cricket in general, it's just well with batting, if you make one mistake, your day can be over, and you have to wait a whole week or a fortnight sometimes yeah. in Australia, or even more in in two day cricket, where until you get a chance again and and so we dwell on it. We dwell on our mistakes. So it, it really can eat us up. And if we, if we don't forgive ourselves quickly, we then carry that mistake forward. And then that plays a huge part on, oh, I've got it. And then we start trying harder. We start needing to score runs more. We become more and more desperate. And then when we bat, we've got more to lose. And then we become tense. And, and then it becomes this negative cycle where, 
we're so desperate to do well that it's actually actually hindering us doing well. So I think confidence is, and it's such a statistics-based game. Like you say, it's a team game played by individuals that you, you can't hide from your statistics. Mm. So if you've scored a duck last week and seven the week before, everybody knows that you're low on runs. And so you're desperate to then score runs, feel a part of the team, contribute to a victory and, and really be loved by your teammates and so forth. So I think the best players, they have a deep belief within themselves that I am good enough, I know I'll score <laughs> runs soon. And that belief allows them to not put too much pressure on this innings, on the next innings. Yeah. Whereas most amateurs, most people, they go to the nets and the harder they train, then the more they have to lose. And so then they put more pressure on themselves. And I, I know we're going to chat a bit about pressure. So it's a really tough mentality. It's a tough, it's a tough yeah. game we play. And I think a really, a really good point, uh, there's a great podcast. Mike Hussey was interviewed um, on the Howie Games, a really popular podcast here in Australia. And he said in this podcast, he said, he asked Shane Warne, how many good days in your career do you think you had? Mm. And Warney, the one of the greatest players of all time, he thought about it for a lot for a long time, and he said probably fifty one percent I had good days. Wow. So if one of the greatest players of all time is only having a good day one in two, us us mortals, us amateurs, are gonna yeah. are we gonna have? There's an old cliche that says we have more bad days than good, and I think it's very true. So I think it takes a real special character to be able to keep showing up, keep mm -hmm. showing up, keep mm -hmm. showing up, even when the results aren't going well. And I yeah. think the best players, they can detach themselves a bit from the result. They really focus on their process and they know, they've got a mindset of knowing that I can't control a lot of things in the game, the wicket, the umpiring decisions, how good the bowlers are, I might get run out by my partner. There's so many things I can't control and that go against me mm -hmm. that I just need to focus on me and my process. And if I get that right, over a long period of time, I'll score some runs. But yeah. I'm not going to score runs every time I bat. And that mentality allows them to relax and they don't have the tension. And, and I think the players that don't have the full, the full belief in themselves, and that's most of us, if they score runs, they think they're a good player and they have confidence. Yeah. If they don't score runs, they then they devalue <clears throat> themselves and they don't have any confidence. They think, I need to score runs to show I'm a good player. If you yeah. truly think, okay, I'm good enough, I'm working hard, I'm preparing well, then you don't have the desperation to score runs and it'll come easier. If, I hope that makes sense. No, it, it, it makes sense. And I guess, you know, when, when batsmen are in a rut and they, you know, they have three, four, five innings where they're not scoring any runs or the bowler gets the yips and he just can't find his line and length. It's, it's a mindset shift, is it, that you're suggesting? Absolutely. I think then it's about trying to go back. If you're really low in confidence, low in form, what you generally try and do is you try and change something. You're, you're desperate to change um, what's, what's going on. And the first thing that's tangible that you can try and change is something technical. And yeah. so you start fiddling with, if you're a batter, you start fiddling with your grip or your head position or your setup. And if you're a bowler, you might fiddle with your run up. And, and then not only do you have all the pressure you're putting on yourself for the results, but you start having all these other thoughts that you have to deal with while you're competing. <clears throat> and most normal sort of amateur players, sorry, my, my tripod's falling over here. I'll just try and fix this up. No, no worries. Um, most, most amateur players... They can't, they can't switch between the mindset of tr tinkering and fixing up their technique and, and then going into a game mindset where you've just got to react. You've just got to react to the ball that's being bowled to you. Yeah. So when you, when you can't switch between those mindsets, you end up taking the, all the technical thoughts you've been working on into the game and then whether you're bowling and you're just trying to land it on a spot, but you're thinking about your arm, you're thinking about your release, all these extra thoughts, or if you're batting and you're thinking about, you're thinking about your, your head position or you're, you're trying to react to the ball, you're so clouded, you've got so much going on that you're, you're going to struggle to see the ball, make a decision and move and execute your shot. And that's what we're trying to do. So I think, yeah, it's really just trying to go back to the basics, try and understand what are the basic things I need to do well and what do I do well when I perform well? 
And if you can get that right, then the, the rest becomes a bit easier. You take it back to the absolute basics and then the, the game can be simplified again. Yeah, yeah. Well, listen, we've all been there and that, that's really useful advice. Um, but somewhere, somewhere we've all been as well is, is feeling the pressure, you know, out in the middle. Um, and, and I think most batsmen in the world feel the pressure before their first delivery. You always get the butterflies in the stomach. Uh, I th- I th- you know, whether you're an amateur cricketer or, or an international cricketer, I'm sure most people feel that pressure. Uh, you know, pressure, uh, you know, batting against a good bowling attack when you've got a certain run rate you need to hit, uh, for, you know, for bowlers, you know, bowling that loose delivery and, and fear of bowling that, the loose delivery when you don't have many runs to play with. How do people sort of overcome these nerves, you know, when you go into bat or when you got, get given the ball by your captain? Um, is there any way people can learn to deal with this pressure? Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's, it's a really timely discussion because today... I host a podcast, uh, I host two podcasts myself, um, and I host one with Chris Rogers, former Australian opening batter, yeah. and it's called, it's called Under the Lid, and we try and share a lot of mental skills and mindset sort of techniques that people, anyone, can, can adopt in their, in their game. And today we interviewed a sports psychologist, one of the Cricket Australia sports psychologists, and I asked him about dealing with nerves and how do people deal with nerves. It's such a common thing. It's something that holds a lot of people back. And he said, the first thing you have to do is you have to normalize it. You have to realize that that is very normal. Like yeah. even the best players, and he said, you think about the best players and we think that they're not going through those things. But there's loads of information, data and, and studies that show even Roger Federer, Steve Smith, anyone, that you, you, we all think are great athletes, they all go through it but mm-hmm. they have a process or a routine that allows them to be comfortable and then not be scared of the nerves. Most people fear the nervousness. They fear, okay, I want to do well. I'm desperate to do well. And then they get nervous and then they're scared. Oh, I'm nervous. What, what I'm, it means I'm not going to do well. I'm, what if I make a mistake? Mm. And that holds them back. Whereas if you go, okay, I'm really keen to do well today. I'm nervous. Okay, that's awesome. And you change the story a bit. You change the story about what the nerves mean. So if you start thinking that nerves are good, that's your body giving you energy. And if you use that energy to your advantage, it can really be helpful. But just understanding that someone like Rafael Nadal, he's a very nervous person. So when you watch, if anyone's ever watched him play tennis, before he, and this was what Peter Clark, the, the gentleman we spoke to today, who's the sports psychologist, he shared this story and I'm sort of repeating it. You watch before the first point of the match and he runs and he jumps and blah, blah, blah. And it's part of his routine, but it's him getting rid of nervous energy. And then before every ball, he follows a very particular routine where he tucks his hair behind his ear. He bounces the ball a lot of times. He's taking deep breaths and he's following a routine that allows him to channel that energy into his sort of executing his skill. And whether you're a batter or a bowler, the most important skill any cricketer can have is having our mind in the present moment. So if you can, you could be the best batter in the nets or the best bowler in the nets, but if you can't focus your attention on the present moment, you then won't be able to execute your skill to your ability. So having a, so first of all, first thing is about nervousness is to understand it's normal. It's okay. And it doesn't mean you're not going to play well. It's absolutely fine. Second thing is having a routine or a process that you can follow that allows you to then a feel comfortable, but B just then execute your skills. Even if you are nervous, even if you are nervous, you can still execute your skills if you're able to focus on the present moment. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, some people, especially recreational cricket, you know, there's a lot of sledging and banter and some people love that and the pressures that come with it, you know, the close fielders and they rise to the challenge. But some people sort of hate it and they crumble with that, with that pressure, um, especially, you know, when they're facing their first few deliveries. So it's kind of interesting to me that there's a psychology behind how a captain and their team should behave depending on the batsman's character to try and sort of get the edge over them. How much of an effect do you think um, a captain applying pressure on a batsman actually has? Um, well, I think a lot, really, but I don't think it's just the captain. I think it's a collective. So the one thing, 
as everyone watching who plays the game knows, it's it's 11 verse 1. Everyone mm. will say it's 11 verse 2, but when the batter's on strike, he's on his own. His mate is at the other end. He's not piping up saying everyone shut up. It's the 11 fielders sort of yeah. attacking him. So I think... Yeah, and everyone responds differently. Someone like Shane Warne used to want to pick a fight because he got the, that fired him up. Yeah, I don't know if how many I don't know how many of your viewers have recently watched the, the the Last Dance, the Michael Jordan series on Netflix. And Jordan used to make up stories in his head about what the opposition have said to get him into an, a mental and an emotional state that would allow him to then perform at his best. And and yeah. some of the greatest athletes i think get to that place where they want to they're so competitive that if it's all nice and friendly yeah, they don't yeah. like that they don't like that they want to compete yeah, Whereas yeah other people other normal amateur cricketers um they they enjoy a friendly atmosphere they feel more comfortable when it's really hey mate hey go on well, what's going yeah. on so so i think it really depends on the character and yeah. as a captain you can lead that um and I suppose you can try verbally distracting the player as long as you're not going over the top and you're becoming too personal personal yeah. and, and stepping over the line. But every player, you can try and get in their head. And if you can get in their head, I was just talking moments ago about keeping your mind on the present moment. As a batter, all you want to do is focus on that ball so that you can and not let your mind wander to and it, the, what normally happens is our mind goes to the past and we dwell on the past or we get anxious and worry about the future and if you if you're able to keep your mind on the present moment that's when you can execute your skills the best so if if fielders if the fielders and the close in fielders the slips the bat pads whoever if they can distract the batter by saying something and saying your technique's no good or oh this bloke's a bunny and his mind as the batter starts to go, oh, I'm going to prove this guy wrong or oh, my grip's fine and you start, you're then not going to make a good decision when that ball's coming yeah. down at you. So yeah. I think there's, there is power in that, but some for some players, that'll fire them up and that'll get them into the best performance yeah. state for them. So as long as you're not... And, and sledging or sort of having banter is part of cricket. So everyone, you have to be thick-skinned and you just have to understand if someone's sledging you, I say this to my young athletes, generally it's a mark of respect because yeah. if, if they don't respect you as a player, they probably don't need to waste their energy sledging you. They can probably just yeah, go, they oh, won't bother. Out. Who cares? Won't bother, exactly. But if, if they think, okay, this guy's a decent player, we need to try and get in his head and, and make, let him, make him make a mistake, yeah. then that's a mark of respect that they think you're decent. So rather than being scared of sledging, I sort of try and put a positive spin to it with my athletes and say, just think, oh, these blokes rate me. How good's this? And yeah. like, just like enjoy the, the commentary or the banter rather than be scared of it. Yeah, no, good points. Good points. Um, I want to talk about captaincy now. Um, obviously, it brings its own pressures. You're now not responsible just for your own game, but for your whole team. So I'm not sure if you've ever been a, a captain yourself before or not, but have you got any advice for captains on how to manage the wide array, array of characters that you get in dressing rooms and also how to deal with crunch situations, be it, you know, setting um, fields for, um, you know, when the pressure's really on, bowling changes, especially when your backs are against the ropes and you've got two informed batsmen. Uh, what, sort of, what sort of advice can you give to captains to, for dealing with pressure on the field and off the field? Look, I think the first thing any captain needs to understand is that they're not going to get everything right. If you want to be perfect and you think you're going to get everything right, you're setting yourself up for disaster and you're setting yourself up for sort of disappointment. So I think the best thing any captain can do is just do their absolute best. Listen listen to those who they trust and they, they think give them sort of good, good knowledge and, and help, I guess. But ultimately, you can't expect to get everything right. And you forgive yourself you want to be able to move on and and just keep trying to move forward and and i think any captain it's one thing to say the right things but it's another to to lead by example and the best captains they lead by example with their behaviors with their attitude with their standards that they set 
So I don't think there's any magic formula to being a captain. I think, I, I think that uh, probably a, a just as important point is that anyone can be a leader. You don't have to have the C next to your name or you don't have to be the captain to be a leader. You can lead by your actions and your behaviours. And I think every cricketer should, or every person should be trying to be a leader within their environment. And the more leaders you have, I think the better the team's going to be. The more people are going to stand up under pressure, the more people are going to want to be involved in the contest when it gets tough. So I think um, captaincy in itself, if you, if you can have a mindset of I'm going to do my best, I'm going to make... I'm going to make the decision that I think is right at the time with all the information that I have. And if I get it wrong, so be it. Then you can do it without pressure. You can just yeah. do it. But if you are so desperate to get it right, you're so desperate to win, then you're going to feel like, okay, everything rides on that decision. And that's not a great place to be because you've, you're putting yourself up to under unnecessary pressure. So captains, I think have to be tactically astute. They have to understand the game well. They have to be excellent communicators. They have to speak to their bowlers. And for me, when I, I've been captain of a lot of teams, I was captain of my first grade side here in Perth for a few years, and I had plans, and I, could, I felt like I could read batters quite well. I know batting quite well, so I could see what the batter was trying to do and, and where their deficiencies were, so where we could attack them. But ultimately, I, was, I would put a lot of faith and trust in my bowlers and say, where do you want to bowl? How are you going to get him out? What field do you want? Give them ownership. Give them autonomy to make their own choices rather than being a dictator. And then that gives them the freedom to play their game as well. And if they get it wrong, then so be it. Um, yeah. But if I'm just saying you have to do this, you have to do that, it might be completely opposite to what they want to do or what they're good at. So yeah. when I'm doing it tactically, it's a, it's a combination and I'm taking advice from my wicketkeeper and my mates, my senior players in the slips, and then I'm making the best decision that I think at the time. And since I've stopped being captain, I'll often go to my captain and say, here's what I'm seeing. This is what I think. And I've yep. played a lot of cricket, so I know the game quite well. But he doesn't have to listen to me. And he might often, he'll go, nah, I think we'll keep going with him or I think we'll keep this field. And sometimes what I thought will, will come off and I'll be like, oh, well, we should have done that, but so be it. And sometimes what I thought won't come off and what he thought will come off. So we can't always get it right. You just got to accept that and just do your best. I, I guess one other challenge a captain might face, um, where, especially decision making wise, is you know, for example, if you've got a, a bowler that's that's having an off day, um, do you sort of do you sort of back him and, and continue to give him a couple more overs, but risk damaging um, you know the team's chances of winning the game, or do you take him off and, and, and sort of ruin his confidence a bit after a couple of overs? Um, that's, that's a challenge you know lots of captains face. What's the right way of going about it, or is it just instinct or what you feel at the time is the right thing to do yeah I th right answer to that as a whole um have i still got you there yep 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 i lost you for a second but you're back i don't think there's a right answer as a whole i think it's it's managed individual but i think that i think that if you You've got to put the team first. And sometimes players have to bounce back from adversity or they have to bounce back from poor performances. So that's on, that's on them. But as a captain, I'll always be supportive of my, my, my player. I will always say, mate, I'm going to take you off. I'm going to try someone else. But you're, a, you're an important member. I need you to come back later and, and, and win us the game or bowl a tight spell for us or whatever. And, and then... Yeah. sort of understand that they're going to be a bit emotionally fragile for a little while and try and get around them as much as, as we can. Um, but you've got to put the team first. And, and if you've got a lot of runs on the, you know, on the board and you've got sort of, um, you've got a, an opportunity to bowl them through a bad spell, but sometimes it's the best thing you can do for a bowler is, is take them off, let them have a rest, let them think about what they're doing, let them reflect and, and, and learn from what they've done. And bring them back and they'll often bowl a lot better because they've had that time away from the action to think about things. So, but you can't, you can't worry about hurting people's feelings. You can't worry about being nice. You've got to do what's best for the team. And those, those sort of athletes, those people have to be good enough to handle that. Fine. I, I wanted to shift the conversation now to a bit about mental health. 
Um, and, and with lockdown, especially in the UK, I'm not sure how much this will affect Australia with your great all-year-round weather. Uh, but in the UK, there may not be cricket season this year. Um, you know, the last time I played cricket was, was, was September last year. The next time I might play cricket could be next April. Um, so cricket is obviously a sport that, that lots of people uh, enjoy playing, but it also helps their mental health, you know, to sort of escape, have a day out with your mates in, in the sun and, and, and you know, people, people love playing it. Do you, do you think the absence of cricket will have a negative effect on some people's mental health, um, you know, a whole season without cricket? And if so, what can people do to sort of overcome this? Absolutely, absolutely it will because a lot of people, cricket is their, their most enjoyable thing they do It's or one of the most enjoyable things they do. It's their, it's their they get to spend time with their mates, it's their, it's their exercise. There's so many positives to playing team sport or any sport really, but mm. team sport, whether whatever it is, you get outdoors, you run around, you get fit, you, you have the camaraderie of your teammates. So I think we'd be all lying to ourselves if we said it's not going to have a, a um, detrimental effect. However, it's up to each individual to try and make the best of a bad situation and, and try and find ways to keep themselves busy and occupied and challenge themselves and stimulate themselves in ways that they, they aren't getting from cricket. And so for me, some of the things are, are like finding a new hobby or trying to learn a new skill or trying to really stay connected because I saw something early on in this coronavirus. I saw something on that we don't need social distancing. We need physical distancing. So it's a lot of people have actually become more social with people that they, they don't often speak to because they'll, they'll FaceTime family or friends who are on, on the other side of the world and, and those sort of things. So I think, yes, it's really hard. Something that we've all grown up with, something that's a big part of our lives. And, and anyone who's watching this obviously loves cricket. You yeah. and I obviously lo live and breathe cricket. And for many people in the UK, it is tough, but, I think it's having a bit of perspective as well and trying to say that, look, I'm healthy. My family and friends are healthy for those that are fortunate enough to have that. Mm -hmm. um, I, cricket is a, a big part of my life, but it's not everything. I am not, and this is something that I've been talking a lot to my cricketers about and I mentioned this little, a little bit earlier, is I'm not just a cricketer. I'm a human being that plays cricket, that loves cricket, but I'm also a husband, a father, a, a son, a daughter, a sister, a brother. I'm someone who loves to cook. I'm someone who loves to play the piano. And, and you have all these other things in your life that when cricket's taken away. So for me, I, I was meant to go to India in April for three weeks and have 30 cricketers from around the world come and fly into Bangalore and train with us. And I was going to be there yeah, three weeks, two groups for 10 days. And, and then I was meant to be in the UK right now doing some coaching and, and running programs at schools and with my wife and daughter. And, and that all got taken away with the virus. But for me, I've been able to spend more time at home, which I don't normally get in the cricket season. I've been able to spend more time cooking, which I love. I've learned new recipes. And, and I'm trying to just find ways to keep myself entertained, to challenge myself, to do things I enjoy. So I think it's really important. I think a lot of Indian people struggle with detaching themselves as a person from, from cricket. And so I really hope there's some sort of cricket in the UK this year. And it's great to see people in India and parts of India are getting back into the nets and they're able to do that, that thing, this thing that we all love so much. But if you broke your leg, you wouldn't be able to play cricket. If you, if you got injured and um, it's something that everyone faces at some point or another, you can't play. So you've got to find ways to move on and get on with life. And that might be watching lots of cricket and learning from what the good players are doing. There's no end there's to what's available for us to watch and consume and learn. Or it might be listening to podcasts and walking or becoming fit, just training at home and becoming as fit as you can so that when you can get back into it, you can be the best cricketer you can be. So everyone's got different goals. But ultimately, we should all be trying to get better every single day. And if that's our goal, if that's what we're trying for, it doesn't have to be in the nets. It can be doing anything. It can be done all at home, reading, listening to podcasts, doing all those sorts of things. Um, but, yeah, fingers crossed cricket's back and everyone can go back to normality. But in this tough time, I think perspective is really important. Yeah, well, that's, that's some amazing advice. I'm sure it will help lots of the people, you know, tuning in and listening to this. Um, but... 
<clears throat> Continuing with, with, with mental health then, um, and taking it to now to, to international cricket, lots of international cricketers have, have sadly suffered from depression and been very open about that. Uh, and as you mentioned earlier in, in the discussion, you know, cricket is such a stat-heavy game. Uh, you know, individual performances are so easy to scrutinise and, and you can't really hide a bad performance because it's all in the numbers. Um, and these, these obviously cause insecurities. Um, you know, people will be worried about their value to the side, letting their teammates down. Uh, and I can, I can imagine it's even more amplified if it's someone's career or if it's someone trying to make cricket into a career. So that need to sort of be consistent or to, to earn or keep your place in the side um, can be sort of draining on, 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 on someone's mental health. Can you give any advice for cricketers struggling with mental health because of the pressures of the game? Yeah, look, I think it goes back to what I just said about we're human beings who play cricket. We're not just cricketers. And I certainly can't comment on the, the pressures that, that come with international cricket. I, I haven't been there. I haven't lived through it. But speaking to a number of my close friends who have played international cricket and have been in that bubble and have faced those pressures, it is ruthless. You, you really can't escape it when you're at the highest level because social media tells you how badly you're going or the like you open a newspaper and there's headlines and, and it, it is ruthless. So I do feel for those guys, they, they really guys and, and girls, they really do go through t some tough times. But I think, I'm thinking about how can I educate the young athletes that I'm mentoring who are in our programs and in our system who I think are going to go on and play international cricket, not just for Australia, but we've got cricketers in different parts of the world who we're mentoring. And it's trying to educate them that their value isn't just as a cricketer, that they're a person, they're a good person, and that the, if you don't score runs, whether it's your club, your state or your country, the sun comes up the next day and you just keep working, you just keep trying to get better, you just keep learning. And trying, if you have that mindset and you truly believe that, that, that sort of thought process, you don't then, what I call, live on the roller coaster where you score runs and you're really high and you don't score runs and you're really low and you're constantly fluctuating. I think the very best players, they score 100, they, they enjoy it, they love it, all the hard work's paid off, but they don't get too high, they say thanks to everyone, then they wake up the next day, they're the same person. Yeah. They then next innings they go and get a duck, and they don't get too low. They go, oh well, I made a mistake or I got a good ball, and then the next day they wake up and they try and get better. They're not getting too amazing when things are good, and too I'm hopeless when things are bad. So I think it's about trying to stay as level as you can, but also have have things and passions outside of cricket. Yeah. And there was a great podcast I listened to a little while ago, with a guy who was nicknamed the Sports Whisperer. And his name's Ben Crow. He's an Aussie guy. He's worked with Australian Rules Football Clubs here in Australia. And he's, he helped, men, he was a mentor to Ash Barty, the world number one female tennis player. And in it, he said that the real turning point for Ash and what he had to work with her over a number of months what was for her to identify herself as a human who plays tennis, a person who plays tennis, not a tennis player. And that's what I keep saying. We're all people. We've got other things in life. So I think everyone's personalities are different and how we've been brought up by our environment and the way we've been parented and our friends and everything contributes to who we are as people. And some people are more predisposed to mental health issues. Some people are more fragile. They're more um, uncertain with themselves or whatever. And, and then if they're in an environment that sort of, they're constantly in the spotlight and they're constantly under pressure, then they're more likely to, to have mental health issues. But others are, get the same pressure, but they're, they're brought up differently or their personalities, and they handle it fine. But I think for any young person who may be moving towards that spotlight or any cricketer who sort of, yeah, really values themselves on their results, I think you've got to find a way to sort of realise you're, you're a person who plays cricket and... You're not the cr cricket is not everything. Cricket yeah. is not the be all and end all. Um, and if you can think like that, then I feel like the results aren't going to determine your mood and how you feel about yourself as much. Yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> injuries then. So injuries obviously are pain in all sports. No one wants to get injured, um, but obviously it happens, especially cricket. You know being a, a game where you're playing with a hard ball, you know, there's broken fingers and all sorts that happen quite regularly across recreational cricket. Um, 
how do you how do people overcome a long term injury uh, and and sort of the mental mental pressure that comes with that? Um, and also, do you think cricket causes people to be more vulnerable to injuries because of the fact that people may want to push themselves harder um, because the stats reflect failures essentially? Well, look, I think I think any sport is you're predisposed to different types of injuries. Obviously, with cricket, we can do soft tissue injuries, and bowlers particularly can injure shoulders or ankles or knees. Mm. But we also have a collision injury. We have the ball that could, as batters, everyone has to bat. We have the, the danger of getting hit and breaking a finger, like you said, or, um, or in the field you could break a finger or you break an arm or anything. But I think any sport, you play hockey, you could get a stick to the face or to the leg or you play badminton or you play um, soccer or anything, you've got different types of, of injuries. So I don't think cricket in particular. I think fast bowlers, it's absolutely brutal on the body and fast bowlers... Mm have to deal with the fact that they're going to have injuries throughout their career because it's such a tough thing and the body is not equipped or conditioned for, for the loads of, that people bowl, um, especially in India. Um, however, I think, yeah, dealing with it is, is again, it, it, it's the similar stuff to what I was saying. I think it's about trying to have perspective and it's the yeah. same sort of thing <laughs> as right now during coronavirus where cricket's been taken away from everyone suppose it's a little bit different when it's only taken away from you and all your teammates yeah. can still play. You might feel like you're missing out even more. Mm. But I think you can still, if you, it's a team sport, you can still, you can still get involved. You can still yeah. add value to your team. You can still be around the boys. You can still be a part of that camaraderie, boys or girls, I should say. You can still be a part of that camaraderie. I also try and put a positive spin on it to the athletes I work with and say, this is an opportunity. You can't get in the nets and do tra train your technique. So why don't we work on training your mind or training your game awareness and, and maybe focusing, spending that time that you'd normally be in the nets, bowling, batting or, or fielding, doing something else that's going to contribute to your long-term success, doing something that's going to help you become the best cricketer and the best person you can be. And that's not just technique. It is mental skills. It's emotional intelligence and understanding. It's, it's um, tactical understanding and awareness and strategy. It's, it's creating habits and behaviours in your lifestyle that help you be become your best. So I think <clears throat> as frustrating as it is, there, there's an old saying that you can only control the controllables. And if you're injured, you can't change the past. You can't mend yourself quickly. You can't change it, a torn hamstring or a broken finger. You've just got to find a way to deal with it. There's, a, there's yeah. a, another great saying that life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you react to it. So if you can choose how you react and you try and react in a certain way, then, then that's what you can control. You can't control the fact that you got injured. So... I think it's just trying to – and realise that, yeah, you might miss six weeks, you might miss half a season, you might miss a whole season. But in the scheme of life, if you, if you love the game, you'll, you'll play a lot more cricket. Okay, <clears throat> cool. So I, I know you've done a lot of work – well, mainly all the things you do is about the mental side of the game as, as well as the technical side. But do you feel coaches um, generally focus a bit too much on the technical side of the game and not enough on, on the mental side of the game? I know if you were to hire a, a, a coach or if a team has a coach, a lot of the time they'll, they'll analyse you in the nets, fielding practice, analyse your bowling. Uh, but you, you rarely hear people talk about the mental side of the game. A lot of the stuff you've mentioned today in this conversation. Um, what advice can you give to coaches on, on how to coach the mental side of the game and not just um, focusing on technique? Well, I think, I think you're right. Um, most... Almost all coaches, and especially amateur coaches, focus on the technical side because that is what they understand. That's what is tangible. That's where they can, they feel they can add value and deliver results that can be seen. Whereas mental skills, you can't see. You can't, and most people don't know where to start. They don't understand it. So I think first and foremost, no coach should ever talk about something they don't understand quite well. So for me, I'm a batting specialist and I talk a lot about performance, like mindset. And, and, and I'm not a psychologist. I'm just trying to always learn and, and ask psychologists and feedback from what I'm learning from them and, and read and listen to the best players. So 
I don't really talk about fast bowling. I don't know much about the technical sides of it. I don't know about the mental sides of it. I don't know about the, the physical needs of a fast bowler. So I try and stay in my lane and focus on what I know. So I feel like most coaches probably don't talk about it because they don't know anything about it and they haven't learned anything about it. So for me, I when I finished as a professional with Middlesex, I looked back and I thought, I had more to give. When I was playing well, I was as good as anyone. I, why wasn't I good enough more consistently? Why wasn't I my best more consistently? And through that reflection and that sort of want to know why I didn't quite make it, I realised it wasn't my physical skills. It wasn't my technique. It was that I didn't understand and manage my thoughts and my emotions. So that was seven years ago. And so for the past sort of seven, six, seven years, I've been on a, on a journey it's, it, and it's a never-ending journey where I'm just trying to understand performance and not just cricket, but like why, what makes some people successful in business compared to others? What makes people successful in other sports? What makes, like what is success and why do some people achieve it and others don't? Or why do people fulfill their potential and why do others don't? And, there's so many themes and trends and a lot of it is to do with mental skills and emotional intelligence and understanding. So for me, I'm fascinated by it. I'm fascinated by the brain. I'm fascinated by human potential and what's possible. And I'm constantly trying to learn from other sports, other coaches, other um, life coaches who uh, uh, know nothing about sport, but they know about um, life and, and humans as people and and then I try and bring that into cricket and put it into a cricket context, put that into a cricket setting and, and try and help the athletes that I'm working with, try and help them understand how do I become the best technical. So we at Cricket Mentoring, I, I've sort of developed these six pillars of success. Everything starts with technique. If you don't have a, the, the fundamentals of a, the bat swing, sort of on a, from a batting point of view, if you don't have the fundamentals of your balance and your bat swing, you're going to get found out if someone bowls a ball at the stumps you'll get you'll get found out so everything starts with technique and that's also why i think most coaches coach it because that's what the game is based on but then mm. as soon as you've got your technique to a certain level <clears throat> you have to know the game it becomes so the second pillar we talk about is tactical the third pillar is mental the fourth pillar is emotional the fifth pillar is physical and that's about your fitness and your endurance and your strength and all those sort of things not technical and then the final thing that I think contributes to success is your lifestyle, is how, how much sleep are you getting? How hydrated are you? What is your diet like? All those sort of things. So for me, I think when people coach youngsters, technique's really important. It's the most important thing when you're learning. But then people don't evolve and, and learn more about those other pillars, so they just stay talking about technique. And a, a player might not have – it might not be the technique – technical element that's holding them back but coaches don't understand the rest so for me it's just constantly trying to educate yourself constantly trying to learn about why some people are successful what mental skills are how to use them and then you can start talking about it and that's sort of where i've gone okay cool well i completely agree with that you know people focus especially me and, and my teammates at our club you focus a lot on technique but you you, you can uh, take it for granted how much the mental skills play a big part in your in your performance um but final question for me then as a fan we at the Bharat army we believe we're team india's 12th man so we support the team whether whether we win we lose or we draw but not every fan does how much do you think um the support that fans give or the opposite the lack of support a fan might give to to, to a player an international player or or a county player really affects them and obviously, in, in today's society, you've got social media as well and trolling and negativity on social media. How much does that play a part, the, you know, the part of the fans? Yeah, look, well, firstly, I think the Bharat Army is awesome. Um, I think you guys are legends. And whenever I've been to an Australia-India match or I've been, to, um, I've been to some IPL games, I think the passion for cricket in India and with Indian people is, is amazing. And I really commend you guys. I think, you, like you say, you support your team win, lose or draw. And that's the way I think most people should or everybody should. Like we shouldn't crucify out the people we love or we yeah. support when they don't do well. And, and we, we certainly like we hold them in, in, in a high esteem and, and on a put them on a pedestal when they do do well. But at the end of, that, end of the day, they're just humans trying their best as well. And they're going to make mistakes. They're going to have bad days. 
Um, right. So, look, I think, I think these athletes, they become pretty conditioned and they understand that the support is always there and that when things are going well, I don't think they get too caught up in that. I think it's when things aren't going well that they start to hear and read all the negative stuff. That's when it really does get in their bubble and affect them. And some people are better at blocking it out or don't don't listen to the news, don't read the newspaper or whatever, and they don't get too affected. But most people these days, they have a social media account, they check their social media regularly, and they, they read all the, the comments, they read all the negative stuff. And as humans, one of our sort of most essential things is we want to be loved. We want to have a connection with people. And if people are spraying us and telling us we're no good or we feel hurt, and so whether you're Steve Smith or Virat or anyone, you, 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 it does affect them. I'm sure it does. But I think what they've, they train themselves to do is to not give too much energy to that. And something that I'm trying to condition my athletes that I work with and mentor is to not, get, not read the good press and not read the bad press. Because if you listen and to the good press, you're going to listen to the bad press. If you just focus on what you can control, be a good person and be the best athlete or cricketer you can be and listen to the people in your inner circle. Listen to your parents, your best friends, your coaches, your mentors, those people who are on the journey with you, that they're the ones that matter. Most people from the outside don't know you, don't know what you're going through, and they'll always have an opinion. You can't control other people's opinions. You could be the best person in the world, the best player in the world, and someone will think you're rubbish. Someone will think you're an idiot. Someone will give you a hard time for something. So you can't control people's opinions. So the less you listen to it, the less you hear the noise, good or bad, I think the better you're going to be. And it's it's not about being ignorant. It's it's about just sort of saying thank you and being grateful, but not letting it affect who you think you are as a person. If you let the good stuff affect you, then you're going to get too high. If you let the bad stuff affect you, you're going to get too low. So it's just saying, right, I know I'm a good person. I've got good values. I'm good to the people around me. Um, and I'm trying to be the best I can be, then you don't need the, the praise of others and you don't worry about the criticism of others. So it's a really tough thing, but I think the very best players, they understand that and that allows them to just perform. They don't get too caught up. But all in all, when things get tight, I think the support you guys give and the, 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 the love and the emotion you guys bring to a game I think really lifts players. It really energizes them. It gives them motivation and it really helps. It really helps them perform. And it, it just gives them maybe that little edge that the opposition and, and sometimes yeah. when you're an away team, say Australia's playing in India, the Aussies can sense the pressure and that the sort of the, the crowd all over them. And that can make them a little bit fearful. As soon as they yeah. become a little bit fearful, their skills might drop off and on the flip side, if if they if the Indian team fit senses that they're like they want us to do, well, come on, boys, let's get together and let's do this. That can be that twelfth man that you talk about. So I think it can really really play a part in some yeah. instances. But from a personal point of view, I think the best players don't let it get in their bubble too much. Yeah, yeah. Well, listen, I, I feel like I could ask you questions for at least another hour. There's so much amazing advice, so much amazing information and content you've given us over the last sort of hour. Um, I feel we could go on, but we have run out of time. Um, but thank you so much for joining us. For everyone watching, please do check out Cricket Mentoring, their Instagram account. What's the website they can visit? www.cricketmentoring.com. Um, we've got a podcast as well called the Cricket Mentoring Podcast. My other one is Under the Lid with Skulls, Buck and Berkey. Um, and then we're across all the social channels, so you can check us out on TikTok or YouTube or anything like that. Yeah, please, please do check them out. Loads of amazing content. Um, I've, I've been a follower of, of, of your accounts on Instagram and YouTube for a while now. Uh, and there's, there's lots of technical um, advice you give as well as mental on, on, your, on your accounts. Um, and for everyone watching, this will be available as part of Bharat Army Podcast Episode 8 uh, coming out this weekend. So if your friends and family have missed the conversation, don't worry, they can still continue listening, listening to it from this weekend. Tom, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, stay safe and, and hopefully um, <clears throat> we'll be able to see you in Australia for the Test Series later this year. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot for having me and, and good luck to 
everyone in the UK. Hopefully, you guys get some cricket soon. Hopefully, you get to play. Um, good luck to everyone in India. And, yeah, look forward to hosting the Aussies, hosting the Indians, and hopefully we can catch up and I can come and do some dancing with you guys. <laughs> 100%. Take care, Tom. Thanks, mate. See ya. See ya.